This project can be broken down into four phases. The first step was to clear the site ready for development to begin. This involved building a temporary road to divert State Highway 1's traffic and relocating all the underground services that ran through the area. During preparations, archaeologists uncovered historical artefacts and care was taken to make sure they were handled and preserved appropriately. After the site was prepared, the next stage was to dig a trench to house the underpass. The trench was 300 metres long, 18 metres wide and 12 metres deep at its deepest point. To protect the workers inside and to keep the surrounding soil stable, a retaining wall was constructed. This wall was made of 285 steel king posts, buried at various depths into the ground. For added strength, 558 ground anchors were inserted sideways into the ground. A significant geological feature of the site is the groundwater, which flows naturally through the site in a south-north direction. Constructing a deep trench in the path of this flow could have impacts on the buildings on the northern side of the trench, which won't receive the water flow they received before. Because less water means less soil pressure, the foundations of these buildings could be threatened. This problem is overcome by installing recharge wells on the northern side, which pump water around these buildings to maintain the natural water table. To maintain the water table on the southern side, a retaining wall using interlocking steel sheet piles was installed in front of the Mount Cook Police Barracks and Tasman Gardens Apartments. Once the tunnel is constructed, this watercourse will be restored as water will be able to pass under the tunnel and the recharge wells will no longer be required. Before construction began, to mark the important historical and spiritual history of the site, three Māori stones were blessed and laid at the exit of the tunnel by the local iwi Te Atiawa, to protect the underpass and the travellers passing through. A large stormwater pipe was laid, from the low point in the underpass to Cambridge Terrace. In a major storm event, 22 catch pits will capture the stormwater, which will then be conveyed to this large stormwater pipe. Next, the tunnel floor, walls and roof are constructed. Due to liquefaction potential in the alluvial soils, tension piles are installed into the underpass floor. These piles are designed with a bell shape at the bottom to prevent buoyancy and settlement effects during a 1 in 2,500 year earthquake. This design also allows for the tunnel to settle again with minimal disturbance. The tunnel was also designed to accommodate two historic sewer lines built in 1893 that run in a south-north direction across the site. The underpass is now complete. Meanwhile, at the eastern end of the park, the historically protected Home of Compassion Crèche is relocated. It moves approximately 16 metres to the north, is raised 3.2 metres and then moves 15 metres to the west. All the power, monitoring and control systems to support the tunnel operations and park facilities are laid. These all feed from the new plant room located at Martin Square. Irrigation pipes are then laid down to water the 18,500 plants throughout the park. The National War Memorial Park contains a variety of plant life, including native shrubs, ground covers and rain gardens. Most notable will be the trees. Along Buckle Street, there will be New Zealand's iconic Pahutakawa trees, while Australian gum trees will surround the Australian memorial. At the eastern end of the park, near the home of Compassion Crèche, fruit trees, in keeping with the heritage site, will be planted. In the future, the various terraces throughout the park will see further memorials from countries with whom New Zealand shares a close military relationship. Thank <laughs> you.